This has absolutely nothing to do with my message, but I know that some of you drive I-45, and uh, I thought you might be interested in uh, an I-45 incident. Just a few days ago, it was one of those times when the traffic was more stopped than go, and a lady was behind a man in an F-150, they were barely moving, and she bumped him. They got out of their cars and looked. They had barely been moving, so there was no damage. They shook hands. Everything was fine. After a while, the traffic started moving a little bit better, and somewhere around sawdust, he took the exit ramp. So happened that was the ramp that she was going to take as well. And she did. He pulled up to the intersection. There was a red light. He stopped. She pulled up behind him and bumped him. <laughs> he got out of his truck and he came to her window and he said, I'm just curious. How do you stop when I'm not here? Thank you for letting me be here today. I've been very moved by this service this morning. The hymn selection, Jeff, has been wonderful, and the prayers and the Lord's Supper presentation, all just wonderful. Thank you for that. Let me ask you, have you ever been in over your head? I mean, have you ever been in a situation where you were dealing with something for which you felt unqualified. I had a Bible professor in college who was one of the brightest and most knowledgeable men that I've ever known. His name was Dr. Frank Pack. And uh, I don't remember the year. It was sometime after my graduation that Dr. Pack felt call to resign his faculty position at Abilene Christian and go to Los Angeles to chair the Bible department of Pepperdine. I was still a young preacher when I was invited to preach in what we called a gospel meeting at the Inglewood Church in the Los Angeles area. And they did something in their services that totally terrified me. At the end of every evening sermon, they opened the floor for questions where people could ask the visiting preacher any question they wanted to. That was terrifying. On the first night of that meeting, when I got up to preach my sermon, on the third row, I saw Dr. Frank Pack and his wife, Della. I wanted to run. I didn't want him to hear my sermon for one thing, but the main thing was I knew the question and answer period was going to come. And I was reasonably sure that I would not know the answer to a single question, a fear which proved to be horribly accurate. <laughs> and there sat my revered professor. That was a scary situation. You know, when God has chosen people for certain tasks all through the centuries, some of those he chose felt qualified and some didn't. Back in the 8th century BC, God decided to choose a prophet to go and confront the rebellious nation of Judah and prophesy their coming destruction. And God asked a question, whom shall I send? Who will go for us? Well, there was a prophet named Isaiah who apparently felt qualified. He stepped right up and he said, here am I, send me. It was a century later when God 
had to choose another prophet because this nation and people had sunk into abysmal corruption. And so it was time for another prophet to come along and to tell them of the impending destruction that was coming their way and of captivity that was coming their way. God chose a prophet by the name of Jeremiah for that task. He said, before you were born, I set you apart and appointed you as a prophet. Jeremiah did not want that job. And he said, alas, sovereign Lord, I do not know how to speak. I'm too young. He was like Moses out there by the burning bush when Moses was basically saying to God, get somebody else. I'm not qualified for this. But God stuck with his choice with Jeremiah and Jeremiah's fears came true from the get-go. He had problems and all through his prophetic ministry it was just one problem right after another. There are two Jeremiah books in your Bible back to back. The first of those is the book of Jeremiah. It consists of 52 chapters and it primarily is about what is going to happen to this nation and to these people. And then coming behind that is a little short book called Lamentations. It's only five chapters long. And Lamentations is a book about what has happened. So Jeremiah is the before, Lamentations is the after. Let me give you a few verses from the book of Jeremiah that show the rebellion of the people and tell some of the things that may happen to them. Chapter 2, verse 11, where God says, You have exchanged your glorious God for worthless idols. Chapter 4, verse 22, where it says, They are skilled in doing evil. They know not how to do good. Several things are said in chapter 5, beginning at verse 13, where the Lord says, I am bringing a distant nation against you, a people whose language you do not know, whose speech you do not understand. They will devour your harvests and your food. They will devour your sons and your daughters. They will destroy the fortified cities in which you trust and you will serve foreigners in a land not your own. Chapter 6 verse 15. Are they ashamed of their detestable conduct? It says no. They have no shame at all. They don't even know how to blush. Several things that are said in chapter 19, where it says, among other things, I will devastate this city and make it an object of horror and scorn. All who pass by will be appalled and they will scoff because of its wounds. They will eat the flesh of their sons and daughters. They will eat one another's flesh because their enemies will press the seed so hard against them to destroy them. One other verse, chapter 25, verse 11. This whole country will become a desolate wasteland and you will serve the king of Babylon for 70 years. And then we come to that little book of Lamentations. Lamentations. The name of the book tells you what it's about. It's a lament. It's a lament by God's prophet Jeremiah, a man who for 40 years did everything in his power, did his very best 
to save this people and the city of Jerusalem and the nation of Judah, all to no avail. At one point in the book, Jeremiah says, my soul is downcast. Well, how could it be any other way? For 40 years, this man, Jeremiah, had been terribly treated. Let's go back to the book of Jeremiah for a moment and let me give you just a few verses about what was happening to this man, to this prophet. Chapter 11, starting at verse 19, it says, Let us cut him off from the land of the living. And they say to him, Do not prophesy in the name of the Lord, or you will die by our hands. Chapter 18, verse 18, it says, Come, let us make plans against Jeremiah. Let's attack him with our tongues and pay no attention to anything he says. Several verses in chapter 20, where Jeremiah himself is talking about what has happened to him, and he says, I am ridiculed all the day long. Everyone mocks me. And then he wishes that he had never been born. Cursed be the day I was born, he said. Why did I ever come out of the womb to see trouble and sorrow? Chapter 25, verse 3. It's one of the verses that touches me very deeply. It's where Jeremiah is a little over halfway through his prophetic ministry with these people. And he says to them, for 23 years, I have spoken to you again and again, and you have not listened. Several verses in chapter 37, where it talks about how they had Jeremiah imprisoned and how they had him beaten and how they put him into a cell in a dungeon where he remained for a very long time and it says where he thought he would die. Chapter 38 verse 6 where they put him in a cistern and it says Jeremiah sank down in the mud for 40 years. Jeremiah prophesied that if these people didn't repent and turn to him that foreign armies were going to conquer them, that Jerusalem, their prized city, was going to fall, and that Judah was going to fall, and that is exactly what happened. Babylonian armies came and they destroyed that city and they burned that prized temple to the ground. Lamentations is a horrific account of a people and a nation gone wrong. The words of Lamentations are among the most appalling words of suffering that have ever been written. The opening words of Lamentations give you the flavor of all the rest that's coming because the opening words are about the city of Jerusalem. And those opening words, chapter 1, verse 1, say how deserted lies the city, once so full of people. Like a widow is she, who was once great among the nations, she who was queen among the provinces, has now become a slave. In chapter 2, verse 15, is this the city that was called the perfection of beauty? The joy of the whole earth, is this that city? Because this city is in ruins. The people of Judah are broken and defeated in the aftermath of Jerusalem's destruction in 587 B.C. I hear people say that we're living in the worst times ever. 
I want to tell you, if you ever think that we're living in the worst and the most brutal and the most immoral time in history, a reading of Lamentations may very well change your mind. The intensity of the suffering is unimaginable. Children are starving. Chapter 2, verses 11 and 12 talks about the fact that children and infants faint in the streets of the city and they say to their mothers, where is bread? As they faint like the wounded in the streets of the city and their lives ebb away in their mother's arms. Young men and women, it says in chapter 2, verse 21, are being killed by the sword. Chapter 5 says that the women are being raped and that the leaders are being hung up by their hands. There's one other verse that I chose and I, I almost decided not to cite this verse. Just out of a sense of sensitivity. But it, perhaps more graphically than all the rest, reveals how appalling things had become, and so I have chosen to go ahead and note it. Because things were so bad that they had resorted to the cannibalism of their own children. The verse is in chapter 4, and it is verse 10, and it says this, with their own hands, compassionate women have cooked their own children who became their food. People, these are the words that fill every page of this little book, with one exception. The one exception to the tragic laments of this book comes in the middle of it. It comes in the middle chapter, chapter 3, and almost in the middle of the chapter. And those were the words that you saw on the screen a little bit earlier. And here I revert to the Revised Standard Version. I usually use the New International Version, but I revert here to the Revised Standard Version primarily because if we remember these words, these are the words we remember from the Revised Standard. And it also is the words of a song we sometimes sing. And that song has these words verbatim. This is where Jeremiah said, my soul is downcast. And then he says, but this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. My soul is downcast, says the prophet. But this I call to mind, and therefore I have hope. What is it, Jeremiah? With all of this terrible stuff that's happening, with the city destroyed, with the temple burned to the ground, what is it that you call to mind that gives you hope? Four things. Steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. Great is His faithfulness. The Lord is my portion, my inheritance says my soul. Therefore, I will hope in him. It is the only bright point in the book. But what a bright point it is if we have the eyes and the ears of faith to absorb it. 
the ruins are real. There, there is no fiction here. The ruins are real. But after all is said and done, God is still among the ruins. And this is something that we must call to mind because forgetfulness of God and His presence and His blessings will make your life a lament. But remembrance that God's love never ceases and that His mercies never come to an end, that they're new every morning, makes life not only bearable but hopeful even exhilarating. We have seen things that we never wanted to see. 9-11, Sandy Hook, Sutherland Springs, Santa Fe, Uvalde, Ukraine, things that test our faith and sometimes shatter our hope. Jeremiah looked at similar situations, terrible things that were happening, things that seemed hopeless. And he said, my soul is downcast. Maybe yours is too. But he said, this I call to mind and therefore I have hope. The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They're new every morning. While you slept, He restocked the shelves with mercies, fresh mercies, every morning. The Lord is your portion. He is your inheritance. And therefore, you have hope in Him. I hope that no matter how bad things get, here is a handful of things that we can call to mind that give us hope. I commend these words to you this morning. Words that find their place in what is arguably the most depressing book in your Bible. Because they tell us that in the midst of the worst things that can possibly happen, those of us who belong to Him have the assurance of His unceasing love and His constant mercies. I commend the words to you and I close with the words of Paul in Romans chapter 15, verse 13. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in Him so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. If you have any need this morning that might be answered by your response to the invitation of the Lord, we're going to be singing a song and there will be an elder here at the front of this auditorium. You can step out from wherever you are and come and visit with him. Let's stand please together and sing.